I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm very worried about several things. Oh, and what are they? Well, I'm worried about Flash because he's captured by the giants. And I'm worried about Roy Rogers because one of the outlaws has escaped. And I'm worried about Rusty Rowley because Tex and Rusty have driven right into a trap and don't know it. Yeah, they're all in serious trouble today. Yes. So could we please quick read the comics so I can see what's happening to them? Well, yeah, certainly we can. You want to start right now? Yes, please. So please read the funny. Puck the comic weekly. Yes. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, bringing up Father. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A rig a doo a doo a rig Let's have a merry Irish jig. Today, Jig's wife, Maggie, has gone out and locked him in the house to make sure that he doesn't get a chance to go out. Second picture, Jig's looks out the window and sighs. Ah, I might as well be in jail. No use trying to jump. It's two stories. I'll break my legs. Last picture, top row. A truck pulls up and stops beneath his window. Uh oh. Now, where did that truck come from? So Jigs puts on his hat. First picture, second row. Climbs out the window onto the truck. Uh, easy now. I'm not as young as I used to be. Uh, hey. Well, I don't know where I'm going, but at least I'm out of the house. Last picture, second row, the truck is out of town and is driving through a gigantic gate. Jake sees large stone buildings with barred windows all around him. Uh-oh, where am I? This place looks familiar. First picture, bottom row, the truck comes to a stop. Jiggs climbs down off the truck and an armed guard holding a machine gun exclaims, Hey, what was you do riding on the top there? A wagon too crowded? You know, listen, how do I get out of here? <laughs> That's what all the guys in here would like to know. And Jake turns around, looks at the truck, and sees a sign painted on it that reads, State Prison Patrol Wagon. And the guard says, All right, listen, Bob, you can explain your story to the warden. Last picture, Jiggs is in a cell, playing cards with a prisoner who's wearing a striped uniform. And Jiggs, who loves to play cards, smiles cheerfully and says to the guard at the door, eh, You can tell the warden when he's finished to come in and join us. And the guard says, Well, now, uh, I'm off duty in a minute. Uh, can I join in? And the prisoner who is playing with Jiggs complains, Oh, gee whiz. No privacy in this place. <laughs> That's funny. Jiggs was locked up in the house, and when he took that truck ride, he found that he was locked up in the jail. <laughs> yes, but at least he thinks he's having more fun in jail than he would have at home alone. He, yes, you remember he said when he was looking out the window at his house, he might just as well be in jail. Yes, well, he's there now. <laughs> and what surprised me is that he's enjoying himself. Yes, all that Jiggs. He's some character. Yes. He's some character. And there's another character that you're fond of that we might read next. Oh, I'll bet you it's Donald Duck. You bet you're right. So let's turn over the page and go past little Iodine and Prince Val, who's in Ireland trying to see King Rory and is having a very difficult time there. Then turn over that page, and here we are with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squiddy chicka chack. Let's have music to pet a quack quack. Donald is looking at a calendar, and he sees that it is vacation time. He says, 
By golly, this year we'll take a vacation in style. Last picture top row, he's at a travel bureau to select a place to go on his vacation. He says to the clerk, Ah, uh, show me some of your best tours, pal. I got itchy feet. First picture, second row, the clerk says, Oh, yes, yes, um, itchy feet. Uh-huh, mm, let, let me see. Oh, here we are. And he hands Donald a circular on Africa. Donald exclaims, Round trip, $3,000. Wow! And don't forget, it includes a hunting license for one elephant. Uh, uh, maybe something a bit closer to home. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm subject to homesickness. Oh, yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, let me see, um, a deluxe Pacific cruise at 2,000, or uh, the Riviera for one. Last picture, second row, Donald says, uh, maybe I better see America first. Oh, good, good, good. Here's a luxury tour of the national parks for 500. Uh, uh, yeah, sounds very interesting, pal, but uh, would you excuse me, please? I gotta go home to set a mouse trap. <laughs> Second picture, bottom row, Donald's at home. He says to his nephews, Huey, Louie, and Dewey, Well, boys, how about going camping for our vacation? Yippee! Keen! Swell! Okay, let's get packed. That night, Donald is in his tent, ready to go to sleep, when he hears his nephew's voices coming from another tent. Shape start. Piker. Tight one. Donald yells. Quit griping. You said you'd like a camping trip. At last picture, we see the two tents pitched in Donald's backyard. And now Donald is sound asleep. And Louie and Huey and Dewey are sitting in the other tent. And Huey, hearing the snoring, says. Listen to him. I wish I knew where I could get 50 mosquitoes. Yeah, big deal. Some camping trip. Yeah. 15 feet from the back doorstep. Well, I don't blame the boys for being angry. I thought Donald was going to take them on a camping trip in the mountains by a river someplace or a lake someplace. Yeah, to be honest about it, I thought that's what he was going to do, too. And instead, they have to sleep in tents in their backyard. That is not much of a camping trip. No, I'm afraid it is not either. Well, now... Oh, now, could we please see what's happening to Flash Gordon? Because you remember last week, they were all captured by that giant. Oh, yes, that's right. They were investigating the planet Titan, and they found themselves locked in a cave. And when they tried to escape, the giant scooped them into a big basket. And now they're prisoners. I wonder what will happen to them. Well, let's read now and find out. So let's turn over page five. And here on page six is Flash Gordon. A rigga rigga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> the pilot exclaims, Hey, we're trapped. Caught like a basket of fish by this dumb brute. Flash snorts. Some dumb brute. He smokes us out of the cave one by one, grabs our equipment, and tosses us into this basket. He's dumb like a fox. Midas pulls his rocket pistol. Well, he didn't take all our weapons. I could get a lucky shot. He takes aim with the side of the basket and pulls the trigger. <laughs> Suddenly, the basket is turned upside down, and the giant shakes them out of it. Last picture top row, Flash says, Hey, hey, you're spilling us out. Yeah, no, we're really in for it. First picture bottom row, as they sit up on the ground, the giant scoops up Midas. Hey! And shakes him until a pistol drops out of his hand. Hey! I let, I let, I... <sighs> well, there goes our last pistol. Last picture, Dale stares at the giant, who towers above them and says, He has our guns, our pistols, everything. We'll never see Earth again. Flash comfort, sir. All right, now take it easy, Dale. There must be a way out. And Midas says, Yeah, and I'm taking it. I'm going to run for it. Oh, look at that giant. Did you see his hand was as big as Midas when he picked Midas up to shake the pistol loose? Yes. How can Flash and Dale ever get away from so powerful a person as that? Well, I'm sure I don't know. We'll have to wait and find out more about this next week. 
But now look across the page. On page seven, there's the sword in the road. Oh, yes. And I'm anxious to read that because it's in the early days of England when Henry was the king. Yes, and Henry's sister, Mary Tudor, has fallen in love with a handsome captain of the guards named Charles Brandon. And Charles Brandon loves Mary Tudor, too. Yes, but the king wants her to marry the king of France. And he had ordered Mary to come to him so he could talk to her about it. But Mary wouldn't come and talk to the king, and the king was furious. I wonder what he will do. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with a sword and the rose. It's merry, merry England, when knighthood was in flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. Enraged by his sister's refusal to meet the French ambassadors with their marriage proposal from King Louis, Henry charges into her chambers. The king is followed by the ambassador from France. He stops before Mary, who is sitting on her bed. The king glowers. Last picture top row, Mary says she understands that the gentlemen of France come with an offer of marriage from their king. First picture bottom row, the French ambassador kneels and hands Mary a beautiful and valuable necklace. My august master sends this little token of his love for his queen-to-be. Mary looks at the necklace and then says, Go home and tell your silly old master it is thus I regard his suit. And tosses the jewels to the floor. King Henry roars, By the soul of my father, you will marry Louis of France within a fortnight, or I'll have you whipped to death on Smithfield pillory. <laughs> Later, Mary sends for Charles Brandon, the guardsman for whose sake she has spurned the queen's crown. Instead, Brandon's friend, Cascadin, answers her summons. Mary looks at him in surprise. Last picture, Cascadin says, Your Highness, Charles has resigned his place at court and is off to Bristol, there to take skip for the new world. Yes, I'm afraid he believes that he has no chance of ever marrying Mary and so wants to go away someplace so he can forget her. But look at Mary. She's unhappy. She looks as if her heart is broken. Yes, she does. I wonder what she'll do now that the king is angry at her. Oh, my. I, I just wish she could stop Charles Brandon before he leaves. You think she will? Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now it's time to pick up the first page of the second section. Yes, and there's Dagwood and Blondie. I wonder what funny thing Dagwood does today. Well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. But I'm a food, I'm a thumb, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Blondie says... Dagwood, let's go next door and call on the Woodleys. Fine, Blondie. I'm in the mood for a game of bridge. As they go to the door, Dagwood says... We'll go around the back way. It's shorter. And at the Woodley house, Herb Woodley says to his wife, Tootsie... Hey, Tootsie, come on. Let's drop in on the bump sets for a chat. What do you say? Good idea, Herbert. I was bored with my book. First picture, second row, they go out the door. Herb says, uh, we'll go around the front. I want to turn off the hose. Oh, I just love these little neighborly visits. Two minutes later, the Woodleys are ringing the bump sets front door. But, of course, there's no answer. Now, how do you like that? They won't answer the bell because they know it's us. Oh, I'm sure they're home, Herb. <laughs> and at the same moment, Blondie and Dagwood are at the back door of the Woodley house, last picture, second row, knocking on their door. And, of course... They don't answer. Dagwood exclaims angrily, They're playing possum because they saw us coming. <laughs> Getting no answer, Dagwood and Blondie dash home. Into the house, through the back door. Dagwood dashes for the phone, first picture, third row. Oh, Dagwood, forget it. No, I'm going to phone them to prove they're at home. At this moment, the Woodleys have come in their front door. Herb dashes for the phone. Well, maybe they really were out, Herbert. 
Well, I'm going to phone and find out. And last picture, third row. Dagwood, who has tried to get the Woodleys on the phone, holds up the receiver to Blondie. And she hears... The busy signal. Dagwood thunders. That drones there, home. I'm going over and teach that guy a lesson. First picture, bottom row, Herb, who has gotten a busy signal on the Bumstead line, slams down the receiver and thunders. Their line is busy. Well, I'm going over and let him know what I think of him. Oh, Bumstead, there you are. I'll... So, Woodley, hi-hat me, will you? Well, I'll... Yeah, you what? I'll knock your... You'll knock what? Your... A moment later, the girls dash out of the house shouting... Boys! Boys! Boys, stop! We can explain everything! At last picture, the four of them are playing cards. Tootsie and Blondie and Herb, who has a black eye, and Dagwood, who has a black eye and a lump on a head. Tootsie says, I enjoy these little evenings together so much. And Blondie smiles. Let's do it more often. And Herb says... And Dagwood echoes... Four hearts. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Nobody could catch anybody else at home, and, and yet everybody meant well. Yes, but I'm afraid the men jumped to conclusions too quickly. <laughs> yes, they must have. Yes, they must have. What's conclusion? Oh, making up your mind. And Dagwood and Herb made theirs up too soon. Yes, they did. Yes. Well, now let's turn over the page. And look, here's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And you remember last week, Roy and Wildwood O'Dowd captured two of those crooks who had stolen the railroad payroll. But the third outlaw, Ham Hawks, escaped. And he met Mr. Dangerfield. That's the owner of the carnival. He met him on the road, and he stopped Dangerfield and said he was going to help him get away from Roy Rogers. I wonder how he will do that. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip yo Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip yo Hawks turns his horse loose. I get up there. Hawks' horse gallops away down the trail. There. I'm riding with you, Dangerfield. It's slower on that wagon of yours, but if Rogers trails me, my cayuse will decoy him in the wrong direction. Ham Hawks, you are hampering my efforts to locate Wildwood O'Dowd, the star performer in my carnival. Ah, shut up. Now listen, we're heading for Red Horse Bridge, where the loot from the railroad robbery is stashed. Uh, uh, I yield to your wishes. <laughs> Meanwhile, Roy is on his way to Red Horse Bridge and is nearing it, last picture top row. I have a hunch that Ham Hawks will be here soon, Trigger. You'd be surprised to find out that his pal Hard Rock Higgins told me where the money's hidden. Roy rides on to the covered bridge, pulls himself out of the saddle, first picture bottom row, then climbs up on the beams. Okay, Trigger, get out of sight now. Ah, it seems funny that Hard Rock told me about this hideout. I guess he didn't want Ham to get away with all the loot. Roy finds a little room above the bridge. He climbs into it. Now, let me see. Yeah, he said the money's hidden in that barrel. He heads toward the barrel, when suddenly a trap door opens, and Roy falls to the bridge below. Last picture, Dangerfield and Ham Hawks ride up to the bridge. Dangerfield reigns in and sees the body lying on the bridge. Why, it's my bosom friend, Roy Rogers. And he's hurt. Hawk starts to climb out, gun in hand. Yeah. <laughs> he fell through the trap door we rigged for snoopers, Dangerfield. And now I'll finish the job. Ooh, this is terrible. Roy has ridden right into a trap and he doesn't know it. Now he's lying unconscious. Ham Hawks will be standing over him with a gun in his hand. Oh, I hope that cowardly Dangerfield will get some gumption for a change in health, Roy. So do I. Well, we'll find out next week if he does. Now let's go to the very last page of Puck the Comic Weekly, 
And here's Dick's adventure. Yes, and you remember that Dick is in the early days of America working on a newspaper office in California. And news came to the little frontier town that a gold mine has been discovered. And everybody in the town just sort of went crazy and started to go off to dig for gold themselves. Yes, they all thought they'd get rich quick. And Dick said he'd like to go too, but Editor Kemble didn't want to. I wonder if he will go. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack, a zack, a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick and Campbell are walking down the street on their way home from working all night in the newspaper. Campbell doesn't believe that gold has really been found. And as they turn a corner, they meet a mob of men hurrying out of town. So long, Campbell! We're on our way to get rich. Yeah, we'll see you with gold all over us. First picture, second row, Campbell and Dick look down the street. They see shopkeepers nailing up their doors. Windows being boarded up. Stores being closed as the men go off to prospect for gold. And as Campbell sees the whole town being emptied, he says, Why, the whole city's gone crazy. Even the kids. They go to their boarding house and find it completely deserted. The cook is putting on his coat, ready to leave. He yells, Fix your own meals. I'll be a millionaire in a week. You see, Mr. Kimball, everybody's going. Let's us go, too. They can't all be wrong. Last picture, second row. Dick's insistence wins out. Though still unconvinced that the rivers of California are flowing with gold, Kimball decides to see what it's all about with his own eyes. Dick urges... Come on, let's get a couple of horses. Last picture, we're on the road with Dick and Kimmel. A long train of wagons and families are on their way to seek for gold. But every horse had been bought or stolen, so Dick and Kimball must travel on foot. Kimball's not happy. Dick says, They can't all be wrong. Kimball snorts, They're fools. And I'm going to prove it. Just look, everybody's just left everything they have to go and hunt for gold. Yes, and at last Dick and Campbell have joined them. I wonder who's right, Dick or Mr. Campbell. Well, maybe we'll find that Dick and Mr. Campbell are both a little bit right. That's usually the case. I guess so. Yes. Well, now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And you remember, Rusty and Tex were taking a very valuable racehorse named Silver Lad back to the Milestone Farm. Yes, a man named Velvet Kane didn't want the horse to get to the Milestone Farm. So he sent two of his men, Porky and Scrub, to see to it the horse doesn't reach Milestone before Kane can sign a contract selling his horses to a wealthy South American. And I'm worried because Kane's men set up a detour sign leading off the road, and Tex came off the road and ended up by a little bit of a shack in the mountains. And there isn't any place to turn the truck around and get back on the road again. I wonder what Tex will do. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for us, horse and Rusty. (laughs) Mr. Miles is worried because he hasn't heard from Tex. And at the mountain cabin, outside under the trees, Velvet Kane's man, Scrub, is talking to Porky. Well, I think it's going to be hard to talk that big cowpoke out of chopping a clearing here tonight. Getting the van turned around. How about me tapping him on the noggin, huh? No. Bell's instructions are to do no beating up. Now you get back to the bridge. If he gets turned around, I'll blow two blasts on the jalopy horn. Okay, Scrub. I'll guarantee you won't crush that bridge after I fire that dynamite. (laughs) A short time later, Tex and Rusty, last picture top row, have gone out in the darkness, and Tex has begun to chop down some of the trees to make a clearing to turn the truck around so he can get back on the highway again. Rusty says, Golly, Tex, you sure are in a hurry to get home. Wouldn't it be better to do this clearing by daylight? The rest of you isn't going to tell you. But Mr. Miles has had some bad luck financially. Can't explain right now. But he stands to lose Milestone unless we get Silver Lad by Lexington tomorrow. A few miles away, at a sheriff's office, a farmer comes in carrying the detour sign that Kane's men had moved. Hey, Tom, 
I found this detour sign set up on the highway where that dead-end dirt road forks off. What's the idea? State road ain't closed, eh? Sheriff replies, Well, that sign was stolen from that washout of Trout and Run. Say, now, ain't there a cabin somewhere up that road? I was just thinking, Bert, it wouldn't be a bad gimmick for a hijacker to get a truck to go up that dirt road a ways. I got a mind to take a couple of deputies and investigate. Doggone, Sheriff, you're smart as one of them private eyes. Meanwhile, at the Junior League Horse Show in Kentucky, in the barn assigned to the Milestone Farm, Mr. Miles enters. Oh, uh, Jimmy, has Tex called? I know, boss, he hasn't. When that South American gent was here, he thinks you're bluffing about Silver Lad. I think he's about ready to sign a contract with Velvet Kane. <laughs> Last picture, back in the mountains. Porky, kneeling near a plunger with a line connected to the dynamite that's been planted beneath the bridge, says... Yeah, they stopped chopping. Must have cleared a turnaround. As soon as I hear two blasts in the jalopy horn, down goes this plunger. Oh, that means if he pushes on the plunger, the bridge will be blown up, doesn't it? That's exactly what it means. And if he blows up the bridge... Tex and Rusty will never be able to get back on the highway. That's right. And if Tex doesn't get on the highway with a truck, Mr. Miles will lose the order to sell horses to the South Americans. Oh, and that means Mr. Miles might even lose his farm. Why, I, I hope that sheriff gets there in time to stop them from blowing up that bridge. You think he will? Well, we'll find out about that next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. <laughs> Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Connie Gigli Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.